Hello and welcome to this episode on the Road to Middle Earth, the history and inspirations behind Tolkien's Legendarium, specifically looking at the Third Age, so covering The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Our first foray into um, Tolkien studies on this channel. I'm very lucky to be joined by Nathan Head. Hello, sir. Hello, great to be here and be discussing such a wonderful topic with you. Wonderful. And um, if you haven't done so, um, do check out Nathan Hood's channel. He's got um, an, a video dedicated to Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, which I very much recommend. Um, regarding sort of starting this um, conversation, you know, maybe we should um, start by looking at um, Tolkien himself. Um, are you okay with giving like a, um, a brief summary of, um, of Tolkien? You go for it. You go for it. I'm still collecting my notes here at the moment. All right. Um, well, the main um, source for this evening is going to be The Road to Middle Earth by Tom Shippey, um, which I've got linked in the bottom. And um, he uses a quote from a Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream to, to really sum up um, his making of the, the Lord of the Rings. But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancy images, and grows to something of great constancy, but however strange and admirable. And what he is getting at there is describing how the Lord of the Rings isn't some, you know, uh, or you can almost say it's an incidental work of um, great fantasy. It is um, the culmination of 60 years of um, philological and you know historical enterprise on the part of Tolkien, who was you know principally a philologist, and you know what is a philologist? It's sadly it's a um, academic discipline which has fallen out of favour, but was very prominent in the 19th century and was declining during the um, professorship of Tolkien, who was first a professor at um, Leeds and then a professor at um, Oxford. Uh, philology in uh, Greek literally means you know the love of talk or you know the love of learning. Um, but really it comes to the uh, the formation of words and the history of words and seeing language as some sort of historic continuity. And so there's you know something interestingly and very fundamentally reactionary about that. And of course, the the purest element, the perfectionist element of Tolkien came to trying to understand and figure out a pure form of old English and as an extension, old English mythology. So he was very much um engage in Old Norse mythology and um, Germanic mythology in particular, he was um, fascinated with the Goths. And um, one of his, you know, great studies throughout his life was um, the study of Beowulf. And um, he wrote, you know, copious essays, you know, children's books such as, um, oh my God, I've forgot, forgotten off the top of my head now, but um, before, before, um, getting to getting to the hobbit you know he was a, a very prolific um academic and um children's author um you could almost ascribe to him you know characteristics of a 20th century version of um jacob grimm of um grimm's fairy tale fame in germany who of course was both a um a, a great revi a great reviver and um reconstructor of the um the ancient germanic fables and of course um very influential in his contributions to the German language as well, the understanding of the history of the German language, which um, interestingly enough and quite coincidentally we covered on our stream last week. Um, is there anything else you would like to um, point out, Nathan? Uh, just, just a couple of things. One, one of the books is, Far, um, is it Farmer Giles of Ham? Yes, Farmer Giles Which, is the one I was thinking of, yeah. Um, and uh, Ham, Birmingham, where Tolkien grew up. Uh, and I think that's something we might come across as many of uh, his life influences or where his surroundings are somewhat featured in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. He's drawing on his experience of where he's been. Um, but, but just also to add on to the philology aspect and how this connects very strongly with his fantasy writing, in his essay on fairy stories, Tolkien makes the point that language is of itself always has an imaginative character because you're assigning certain words to certain objects in the world, and you can mix and match those words, and there's a metaphorical component to that. It's always transforming what you're talking about. And so, if you're interested in language, you're inherently interested in mythology for Tolkien. The two go hand in hand, and the storyteller kind of brings these two together. So I think it, in his view, it was a very natural transition for him to write something like The Lord of the Rings, whereas maybe to many of us today, it seems like a world apart being a scholar of language and a, a great fantasist. Well, the ironic thing is that um, you could say that the Lord of the Rings universe 
was an exercise in the construction of languages. You know, one of mm. his um, great um, extracurricular activities, of course, you mentioned the fact he was a philologist, but was a way of importing his own constructed languages into some sort of, again, overarching structure. And um, the fascinating thing is, you know, the extent to which this influences the world. Say, for example, um, uh, the Rohirrim, which is something we'll, we'll cover hopefully in quite a lot of depth, how um, the Rohirrim are sort of, again, incidental almost as a result of Tolkien's fascination with the Gothic language and the Old English language. Um, interestingly enough, the um, you could say the consistency of language as being the central theme or constructed language being the central theme in Tolkien's work really breaks down once you include aspects of the Shire. Because um, the Shire is really relatively ac um, anachronistic in terms of the overall structure, it's especially considering that Tolkien was so fastidious in understanding that there had to be some sort of living, again, mythological continuity with the words, and yet within the Lord of the Rings universe itself. I think this is also the effect of um, him, again, having written The Hobbit and not necessarily considered that The Hobbit would um, lead anywhere, definitely not to Lord of the Rings. But... Um, you have the coexistence of Old Norse, as you know, exemplified by um, the dwarves in Middle Earth. You have Old English, as exemplified by the the Mark, the Rohirrim, and you have a more modern variation of English, English in the form of the Hobbits. So all of these um, languages, which really should um, feed off and contribute to each other at different time points, existing in the same universe. And I feel that, you know, we're not going to get into um, characters today, just for a little introduction. This is very much going to be a, um, a world building stream before we get into the characters, hopefully at um, a later date. Um, but I really feel that um, when we talk about the Hobbits, I mean, the Hobbits um, are a invention of Tolkien. I mean, the etymology of Hobbit is um, uh, Holbiat, which uh, I think in Old English means um, hole dweller. And, and there's a wonderful sort of apocryphal story of him marking an undergraduate essay or something and just doodling in his notes saying there once was a happy little hobbit who lived in a hole. <laughs> that's where we get the etymology. Am I, am I, am I wrong there? No, I think that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, um, in terms of the middle earth itself, I think, you know, obviously we're talking a lot about philology. It might help to um, contextualize this um, conversation on middle earth by actually looking at the etymology of middle earth itself. Because of course there is an etymology to it, which is um, Midengard um, in old English, uh, which comes from the Christ poems by Kynwolf. And mm -hmm. um, the, significance of the concept of Midgard, of course, it comes from uh, the Norse concept of Midgard, uh, which is basically the land that um, dwells, and again, I have a picture here, the land that dwells between um, the he heaven and hell, essentially, where all the, um, the races of um, men reside, you know, it being basically a melting pot of all the human beings. And of course, in um, in Tolkien's world, the whole conception of Middle Earth is based on a fictionalized version of Earth itself. He very much wanted to create almost like a, um, a prehistory of Earth. And um, he called this um, territory Arda. Uh, you know, at some point there is a conception of um, Arda, which is flat. And then you have the division of um, Mittengard or Middle Earth away from um, Valinor which is considered to be the, again, the land of the primordial sort of godly beings, you know, the, the king of which being Iluvatar. Um, would you have anything to say on the, the origins of the concept? A again, it's, it's very rich in, um, very rich in mythology, the concept. I'd only add that there's, a, there's another poem that it may come from, which is The Wanderer. Um, there's a line or two, um, I've, I've got it open in front of me. Um, sorry, I can't give you an exact number, but as now in diverse places in this Middle Earth will stand tugged up by winds and hung with hoarfrost buildings in decay. And this is a poem that actually, um, so it's an Anglo-Saxon poem that Tolkien uh, will actually quote nearly verbatim in, uh, I think it's the two towers. I'll give you a couple of lines and you may recognize them. Where has the horse gone? Yeah. Where the man, where the giver of gold? Where is the feasting place and where the pleasures of the hall? So th this poem, um, with its kind of sense of uh, decay and the kind of um, the fading of the world or all that was good in the world seems to be tied in with this notion of Middle Earth, which he's uh, 
with it as well for Tolkien that it's it's a place of where there were great things. There was a great um, mythology, maybe tied to the elves and the Valar, as you've mentioned. But there's a there's a changing of the guard. There's a new age coming to be. Uh, certainly by the time of the Lord of the Rings. Yes, and, and again, this is quite a significant theme. I mean, when reading this, I'm reading this very much as a history. In terms of how the, the elves fit in, again, as with the dwarves, they represent um, much more of the mythological aspects. Uh, when it comes to the um, dwarves in particular, um, there is one sort of claim I want to make about Tolkien in terms of his um, overall influences, um, which is that of the um, Nibeljung Yalai, the, the Song of the Nibeljungen, um, and again, the obvious influence from Wagner. Of course, I think the frustration when looking at the, the inspirations behind Tolkien is that he would famously say that, you know, he abhorred allegory. And I think what, what he really means by that, you can, you can infer so much in the way of allegory from Tolkien. So I, I think what Tolkien was very successful in establishing was that he would never establish a direct allegory to any other work, even though, as you mentioned, he would often lift pieces from his primary sources verbatim. And there would be, um, you know, in terms of sort of overall thematic goals, there would be sort of sim uh, very much similarities. So, for example, um, when it comes to, you know, the Nibelheim, you know, the, the dwarf-like Nibeljungans, you know, crafting precious metals. Um, and a Tolkien so much would despise the idea that there was any association between Wagner that um, he would hold up the ring, you know, um, say the ring, you know, it's round and that's where the similarities cease, um, which is which which is rather interesting. But um, yeah, and again, he he also has significant criticism also of um, Hans Christian Andersen and, um, and Shakespeare. But um, I think it's important to note that they both share the the same sort of source material, which is, you know, a uh, the poetic Edda and um, the Nibeljung Leid. I mean, men mentioning the elves, um, in terms of, sort of understanding what the elves are, um, of course, you mentioned, um, you know, Valinor, um, and, you know, I mentioned Iluvatar, who, you know, you could consider to be, you know, the primordial god. If we were to make a pagan um, um, a a ascription to him, we would refer to him as, you know, Zeus, or even probably, you know, even more primordial or primordial than that, such as Saturn or Uranus. When it comes to um, you know all these successor gods, so we have the um, the Ainur, the Valinor, and, and the Maya. Um, I think it's important to know that you know in, in Christian thinking, you again could ascribe their motives to um, that of angels, but of course in pagan mythology to that of minor gods. But the elves themselves, I would say, are quite distinct. I mean, um, on my last stream, I was mentioning that of course the the elves are. Um, uh, a significant aspect of Germanic and therefore Norse mythology at the same time. And unlike um, the, el the the gods, essentially, or especially the Christian angels, um, the elves in pagan mythology were represented as being um, rather ambivalent towards the fate of man. There's definitely a, um, a view which is, you know, expressed um, quite extensively in Tolkien, how the elves, there isn't a established opinion. I think this is, again, quite successful of Tolkien that throughout um, all the races we encounter, especially at the Council of Elrond, there are very much varying different views of the elves, you know, especially the dwarven antipathy for the elves. So they don't have this, um, you know, what would be the word, um, this um, hero worship established for them. They are very much um, a mysterious race in the same way that um, they were depicted in Germanic mythology. You know, again, the consistency between that being their um, almost supernatural beauty, of course. Um, and their, you know, purity in their, again, when we introduce Galadriel, this idea that um, they will sort of bewitch and um, and bring forth, you know, ill fortune and illness. Um, interestingly, again, I, I understand that there is some sort of overlap when the when Christianity arises in Germany between the transitioning of elves into demons, and with you know the language again, looking at the the etymology of these words, we have. Um, Orkneas, which um, in the you know old Germanic languages means um, a demon born. Of course, you know ascribing that to the fact that they are supposed to be corrupted elves, and the fact that elves would become demons. I think there's you know a, a quite a lot of um, baggage there in terms of the the etymological continuity. Um, do you have any, anything to say on that? I've again very quickly summarised the uh, the broad inspiration for that. I, I guess I would just add that. Uh, I think a really key idea for talking with the elves is their immortality in contrast mm. to human mortality. And this is something that he often plays with and how one, it's a, both for curses in their own way and both in some ways envy the other. And 
more, uh, immortality shapes the elves in terms of their they're tied to the decline of the world. They see it at its height and they fade away with as nature fades uh, and as it were magic fades from the universe. Mm. Whereas humanity um, or men, as Tolkien would say, are being mortal are free from the cycles of the world. They're not bound to the flow of time or uh, kind of nature as it were. And mm. there's, he's touching on this dislocation that he thinks we all feel as, as humans uh, from nature, that we're in some way alienated and we desire fellowship with the world. Elves have that in some way. They, they have a, so as you, you mentioned Galadriel, she has a, a, she's attuned to the, to the wood of Lothlorien. They're kind of bound up with each other, the elves and that wood. Um, and I think you could say the same too of those elves in the Silmarillion that you, you mentioned. And also Whereas the, men um, don't have that. None of the men in Lord of the Rings have that affinity with nature. They've, they've, and I think the hobbits are the most clear example, actually, of this. Because you were mentioning that they're kind of anachronistic or a strange phenomenon in the world uh, of, of Middle Earth. They don't quite fit in with the, all the, the kind of derivations of language. Well, that makes sense because they are a branch of men. They don't belong properly, or they're not, they're not tied to nature in the same way the elves are or the dwarves are to, to the, the mountains. Well, I think um, the claim I'd make against hobbits in particular is I would um, compare them directly to the, the other races of men. I mean, when it comes to languages in particular, and again, seeing the Lord of the Rings as an extension of essentially, you know, Tol Tolkien's playground to establish a world for his constructed languages, um, like a proper philologist, not only does Tolkien construct these languages, but the languages have a history in themselves. So we start off with, um, you know, uh, as far as my, my earliest understanding of, you know, his greater languages, it goes even further back than Noldorin, but then it goes to Sindarin and then Quenya. Uh, when it comes to the, you know, the men, especially the Numenorians, so the Gondorians, um, you know, the post-Numenorians, there is very much um, an affinity in terms of, you know, when we first you know, I introduced a Faramir um, in the two towers, you know, um, it's this, that they are speaking, um, Quine, I think they're speaking Quinya, um, this idea that it forms some sort of lingua franca throughout the world. And there are some sort of, um, a, again, there's some sort of um, affinity with the, the older races and some sort of cultural uh, attachment and, um, and again, you see this uh, uh, substantially with all of the, um, the the names, especially of the House of Aenor and the House and the various houses of um, of Gondor. You see it much less with the Rohirrim. But I think um, the comparison I would make is not necessarily that the Hobbits are anachronistic to just the Elves, but they are anachronistic towards you know, most of the elements, almost as if they are a um, kind of like an ode to um, to sort of early early modern England, English society in a way, even though, you know, in terms of their political structure, for example, their very loose political structure, you know, uh, under a nominal Thane who um, doesn't really exist at this point, especially towards the end of the Third Age, you know, it's, um, supported by the um, uh, Dunedain, um, that they do represent some sort of, paradoxically, despite their language, you know, even their custom like eating potatoes and um, smoking pipe weed, which have again very much um, post um, interaction with the new world um, factors, if we are to assume that, you know, pipe weed is tobacco, um, that regardless of this, and despite the fact that um, Tolkien would try and um, utilize, you know, his own language, such as that of taters, to try to try and um, uh, to facilitate the use of such things as potatoes in the Lord of the Rings universe, I do think it sort of represents some sort of um, pre-Norman conquest idyll, and very much, I think, you know, a constant theme throughout Tolkien is his desire to um, find some sort of, again, untampered, un, um, unbesmirched English culture or English language, you know, such that existed between the um, the 6th and the 11th centuries. Um, one of the interesting influences uh, pertaining to the Hobbits in particular, which again make them sound more anachronistic and alien, was the fact that he was quite um, influenced, especially in terms of the naming conventions of the Hobbits, uh, with that of America. So, say for example, you know West Virginia, the the Appalachian Hills, and um, Kentucky, <laughs> and very much I think um, he, he was quoted as thinking that um, this represented again a, a, a form of um, 
English parochialism, you know, across the continent, which wasn't um, ensnared to a form of, you know, Latin imperialism. That's fascinating. I had no idea about that. But it makes no sense, given uh, many of those names come from uh, early modern England. Mm. They have their roots that way. And I think Thomas Sowell's done a lot of work on that, actually, with the, the language of the Deep South was actually from, from England. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, I, I have a, a just just while we're on the point of kind of influences on the Shire, uh, I've got an image from somewhere where Tolkien grew up uh, that I could share. If sure, um, I'll put it up and I'll, um, I'll put it up on the screen. Uh, let's see. So uh, this is this is actually where the Middle Earth Festival takes place, uh, or it did take place every couple of years or so. And uh, it's Serhall Mill, which is an area nowadays uh, is part of Birmingham, but it would have been its own village at the time. And this mill goes back to the, um, it's, it's an early modern mill, and it was rebuilt in the Georgian era. But as you can see, it, it just looks like uh, the Shire, pretty much, uh, as, as you would imagine it. Uh, and around this area is lovely green flowing uh, fields with lots of lovely trimmed hedgerows uh, all around. So I think, and this is close to where Tolkien grew up. Uh, so there's a pro possible influence here on, uh, on how he envisioned the Shire to look like. And given what you said about the early modern connection, this mill being early modern, I don't think that that's totally lost, on, would have been lost on him either. Oh. Is everything working? Doesn't seem to be working. Hello? Sorry, the image I've got up is um, an image of um, Peter Jackson's Hobbiton. Um, I, I wasn't able to find your um, your mill image. Um, do you have to um, to share it with me um, in the um, in, in the stream yards, and then I can put it up for you? Uh, this would just be a placeholder image. Nathan. Can anyone um, hear me? Yes, Nathan, oh, I can hear you're you. You're back. Yes. You're back. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, no. I think uh, I won't try and share again. Don't worry. All right. I'll, I'll drop well, the this, link well, this, in the chat. <laughs> well, this will be a placeholder <laughs> for now. <laughs> Even though you know it's a total reconstruction, it's, it's not. Um, it, it's not. Um, it's not the real thing. But nevertheless, you know, continue. Um, talking about um about hob about the hobbits. Well, I, I don't know what was um picked up or not, um, but essentially Sare Hall Mill uh, is close to where Tolkien grew up. It was an early modern mill that was reconstructed or rebuilt in the Georgian era, and it just looks like what uh, the Shire. And uh, around it is lovely grow flowing green fields with lots of trimmed hedgerows. And the people of that area uh, of Mosley, which wasn't part of Birmingham at that time, um, Tolkien thought were kind of simple, honest, hardworking folk, maybe a wee bit um, uh, kind of stuck in their ways and uh, their customs, but nevertheless, they they were kind of decent folk. And uh, it, it, that just sounds like the Shire to me, or at least it, it's, it was a little pocket of, of that kind of early modern society you were talking about mm. that Tolkien grew up around. Well, the wonderful thing, I think um, this is quite a good segue to get on to... Um, the sort of broader story when we're talking about the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Um, Tom Shippey refers to Bilbo in particular, even though, again, this isn't a character-driven stream. I think it would just be interesting, again, talking about our overall subjects and Hobbits, that he was very much a bourgeois burglar, <laughs> essentially in the sense that even, even the word, you know, burglar, even though it, um, I think it means, um, it means just little, it just means sort of home breaker or, you know, something like that. Because, you know, of course, Berg is the um, the originator of home. Hence, we would get um, Berger, which means, you know, city. 
Um, but but nevertheless, um, there's something again even more sort of anachronistic of the fact that he does you know maintain such a uh, such a well-to-do home at Bag End, um, you know, with his pantries, with his meat delivered, etc. And then, of course, you have uh, these these dwarves, which are, um, in terms of their direct inspiration, um, they're basically lifted out of the uh, Volupsa, which is um, another um, a, another Norse saga poem, and. Um, he, he's taken on again an adventure which you know could have happened two millennia before which um is very much what i mean by um by anachronistic so um i think if, if that's all right would you like to talk about the um the themes regarding the hobbit in particular before we get to lord of the rings sure so uh well do, do you want to give me to give a wee summary of the hobbit or, uh oh or... i don't mind giving giving a wee summary of the hobbit so um Gandalf and the party of Thorin Oakenshield, you know, arrive at um arrive at um Bag End, and this pre precipitates, you know, um an adventure across, you know, through the Lonely Mountain where um Bilbo would um interact with Gollum and find the One Ring. Um, the adventure, you know, would continue through Mirkwood, and the, the process of this adventure is to reach the Lonely Mountain or to reach Erebor. Erebor had been um, taken away from the dwarves, having been a dwarven kingdom, and become the um, domain of the, the fire drake, Smaug. And um, near, of course, you have the, the old city of Dale and um, the city of Lake Town, you know, have suffered um, considerably as a result of Smaug. Um, the reason that Bilbo is um, you know, treated into this party of dwarves led by Thorin is because he can essentially sneak in undisturbed. And again, we'll see this when we um, when we get to Erebor. Um, he's very effective at, um, at breaking in, but also um, there's this wonderful conversation which um, he will have with Smaug. And in terms of, again, the influences of that conversation, uh, that again is lifted straight out of the uh, poetic Edda. That is um, very reminiscent of um, Siegfodo's conversation with, um, with Fafner. And again, talking about the Wagnerian influence, of course, um, Tolkien would you know, be very derisive because uh, Wagner used um, secondhand sources and Tolkien would go for the real thing. Um, in Wagner's course, that would be Siegfried and Fafner. Um, and of course, you know, as with everything Tolkien, there is a tiny element of subversion when he's lifting um, these these aspects from ancient myths. So it's not um, Siegfried uh, lying over the um, the corpse of you know a dying Fafner. No, he's um, tricking and again trying to play to the um, narcissism of the dragon. And again, this leads to. Um, dramatic consequences when he's unleashed on um, unleashed on Lake Town. And in terms of, again, the, the little subversive aspects of this, um, we mentioned Beowulf and the significance that um, Beowulf would have on um, Tolkien's understanding of, um, of ancient Anglo-Saxon uh, Saxon culture. Um, well, of course, Beowulf, after you have, you know, him arriving and um, slaying Grendel and Grendel's mother, you have the um, the dragon again coming back again ostensibly because um you know gold had been stolen from him and you know wreaking havoc and um Beowulf would have to um lose his life you know fighting against um fighting against the dragon uh, nevertheless little tiny subversions in that story even though you see so much of that in, in addition to um Thor fighting the I believe it's the Nimhog in Ragnarok which is you know the the end of the world in Norse mythology um, you know, Thor and Oakenshield, you know, wouldn't die as a result of the dragon. And the, you know, the the man responsible for slaying um, slaying Smaug would, of course, be um, be Bard. So all of these tiny little, and again, um, the the interaction being with Bilbo, who is not by any you know um, measure a traditional hero. So all of these um, tiny little subversions that make the Hobbit um, familiar and yet unique at the same time. That's a really lovely summary. And uh, I guess underlying the story, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a few themes, but one of them in particular is home uh, or place of home. So for, for Bilbo, constantly throughout the story, Tolkien will just drop in a line or two where Bil it's like Bilbo was thinking of being back at home, drinking cups of tea. And the quest for the Lonely Mountain is for the dwarves to reclaim their home from the dragon. Mm. Uh, you have the men of Dale who have been forced out of Dale essentially to live on Lake Town and are ho they can't go back because the dragon's too close. You have the doors and 
uh, Bilbo passed through many homes. They passed through the Goblin's home, Gollum's home, the Elves of Mirkwood's home. And so, so there's this sense throughout of home being a really important thing mm. and worthwhile fighting for. At the same time, leaving home, in the case of Bilbo, is what breaks him out of his prudish, uh, kind of stifled life where he's worried about plates, uh, about having too many doors in his house rather than kind of embracing life. Mm. And through leaving home, he becomes courageous. And I think, well, there's the, you know, there's the often quoted hero's journey or, or whatever, which, you know, whether Tolkien would ever have believed in such a thing is another well, question. I think, um, Joseph Campbell was um, contemporaneous to um, Tolkien. I'm sure you know Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. I, again, I'm not that familiar with Joseph Campbell, but nevertheless, he would have certainly been familiar. In terms of, um, again, you mentioned, I do, you know, of course, in Tolkien's um, early life, he was a, um, a commander in, in, in Flanders, of course, during the war from um, 1915 onwards. And I think it's um, very much, I do see some sort of, you know, analogy with himself in terms of this, country idol this almost you know parochial mindset this um again something which is very consistent about the hobbits is that they are um distrustful of outsiders you know that they're very much um <laughs> clued on to anything which you know something which word which we consistently used queer um you know anything you know remotely foreign and um very much we see you know the hobbit grow bilbo grow as a result of this but i, I feel there's almost um a link between that and um, Tolkien's own experiences leaving and joining the war. But again, that's um, a rather trite and obvious comparison to make. It is, but it, it speaks to the humanity of these stories, I think, which is in part what makes them so wonderful, that he's blending not only his own experiences and those of the ordinary people around him, and not only this great mythology that you've just gone through about all these links with Beowulf and Norse mythology, but he's marrying it together. And it's that combination which, they, well, it brings so much joy to many of us. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, again, The Hobbit, it's fascinating in a way because um, there's this misconception again that um, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings was planned. And the interesting thing about the backstory regarding Lord of the Rings is that, of course, you know, in terms of the um, the major crossover, it is the fact that we have the um, the Ring of Power is discovered by Bilbo in the um, in the Misty Mountains, um, but you know very much it was almost designed as a MacGuffin um, in the original you know conception process of the Hobbit. And by a MacGuffin, I mean it was essentially to equalise the usefulness of Bilbo as relative to that of the dwarves, you know, to give him that little edge by being able to turn invisible and to add to his, you know, um, abilities as a burglar. Um, when it comes to Lord of the Rings in particular, it acquires this, you know, again, this this entirely new meaning and, you know, with, with all the rich sort of thematic elements to do with it in terms of, um, you know, Acton's proverb of, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, in addition to, you know, many other sort of thematic elements to it. But I do think, you know, when Tolkien invented the ring, and again, this is why I'm easier on him, you know, in terms of bringing up the Wagner comparison, because, of course, the providence of the the ring of the Nibelung in, uh, again, Wagner's ring cycle is the fact that, like, you know, the ring, there is a primordial element to it. You know, it is forged from the Rhine gold to the beginning at the beginning of the world. You know, by Albrecht, Albrecht, who was spurned by the um, the Rhine maidens, and so the quality of attaining this ring um, is that you have to forswear love in order to have you know total power. And this, you know, in terms of our um, our linkage with um, the Hobbit again, this has um, a similar influence in the fact that um, the ring is part of um, Fafner's hoard. You know, as with Beowulf, you know, and as with Smaug, Fafner is um, guarding this layer of gold. And Fafner himself isn't even a dragon. He's um, he's a giant wearing the Tarnhelm, which um, transforms him into the into the dragon Fafner. And um, in terms of like the the superficial significance, of course, we mentioned the fact that um, you know the the early sort of history of the Ring. Um, the significant thing about the Hobbits regarding the Ring is, of course, that the Ring has a relatively negligible effect on hobbits compared to the other races especially the more powerful races such as the astari you know gandalf being a member and saruman being a member um 
And this is very much the interaction with the ring you see from Siegfried, who it almost sees no value from it, even though, again, we will see with Bilbo, there is definitely a corrupting influence and very much echoes through that with Gollum, who is the much more extreme form of Bilbo when we arrive at Lord of the Rings. So uh, I think, you know, starting with Lord of the Rings, um, I would, I'd like to build upon this conception of um, the idea of the ring itself. Um, would you like to talk about that? Just before we get to the Lord of the Rings, I think there's another influence on on the ring that I just came across the other day, which isn't often mentioned, but I think it's really important, is um, George MacDonald's The Princess and the Goblin. Uh, George MacDonald was a, he was a, a, a Scottish minister in the Victorian era, but he's most famous for his fairy stories. They were very popular. And he's often credited as the founder of, of modern fantasy. And he was a big influence on Chesterton, on uh, C.S. Lewis, and probably on Tolkien. Tolkien mentions him in various essays. And in The Princess and the Goblin, which is probably his most famous story, uh, there's, a, there's a character, the, the princess uh, is given by her great-grandmother a golden ring. And this ring uh, le has a string on it, which she is to follow whenever she's in danger. And this leads her into the mines that the goblins live in so that she can free an individual. Um, I won't go into everything about him, but the point is like this ring is very much connected to being in the home of the goblins and then leading her to safety again at various points. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's this, this very strong connection there uh, with themes that you see in The Hobbit of a ring being in the goblins lair and leading Bilbo to safety. At yeah. various points, and I think that helps to connect Tolkien's work with the idea that he sees the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings in their own ways as fairy stories, and mm. so that tradition of the not folk tales uh, like maybe in the Grimm's uh, f fairy stories as they're called, it's it's not that sort of thing. It's more like a George MacDonald's fairy stories uh, that yes. he he may be getting some influence here on the Ring. Mm. Yes, and I think um, just to, again, this this is a covert way of getting my Wagner stream in with the Tolkien stream. But you mentioned, you know, um, finding again the the ring in the depths of um, depths of a cave. Um, when it comes to Rheingold, um, Loki and Wotan descend into Nibelheim, which is you know again kind of like the Wagnerian equivalent of the Misty Mountains. And there, after playing riddles with um, Albrecht, who is the control of the ring, um, Loki is able to trick uh, Albrecht into, you know, assuming a form which would basically make him vulnerable to being captured and then seizing the ring. And of course, <laughs> I can't help but see that again. And the, the riddles told between um, Gollum and, um, and Bilbo at the same time. And again, Gollum uh, believing again that the, the ring was won by the, the Hobbit by treachery. And therefore, you know, having this deep-seated hatred of the Hobbit as a result. There's a very clear connection there. It's it's yeah. almost unmistakable. Yes. But again, like everything, you know, there is always a slight subversion. There was never, as you know, Tolkien would say, direct allegory in anything he would say, because, you know, Bilbo is just, you know, a hapless hobbit trying to survive. He's not um he's not a god trying to remove a rival to power, <laughs> as with um Votan and Loki. Um, but you know. Moving on from that, um, you know, again, the obvious allusions, uh, allusions to ring. Um, would you say that there is a, a strong Christian element to the idea of the ring? Almost undoubtedly. Um, so, really, I think I think uh, when you, so I've I've done a fair bit of reading of Tolkien's letters on on this sort of issue, and for Tolkien, the ring. Uh, that Fro well, Frodo, Frodo bears it as best he can, but he's struggling with temptation. Mm. And this this verse in the in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I think is very clearly played out in the character of Frodo. I won't go into too much detail on that because we're saving that for another stream. Um, but that notion of it's constantly tempting you, and it's almost impossible. Well, spoiler alert, Frodo doesn't, in the end, uh, overcome it. He is overcome by temptation for the ring, even though he does as best. 
better than anybody else can in probably in the whole of Middle Earth at that time, you still overcome. And I think that's Tolkien saying everybody falls, which is a very Christian idea he's, he's articulating there. There is nobody without sin. Yes. I think, um, yes, I think, and, and again, this, this idea with, um, especially again, going back to Wagner and tying this with some sort of, you know, primordial concept. So the ring is, you know, created by Sauron to, you know, bind all the other rings of power to him. But he himself, you know, is is a fallen Maya who himself, you know, was a disciple of Melkor, um, who had, you know, dissented from from the reign of Iluvatar. So a, again, there's there's a link here essentially between the the ring almost being um, identified with, you know, the original sin essentially, you know, or the first betrayal against mm -hmm. God. So yes, very much um, deep Christian Christian elements there. And and as you were alluding to earlier it's the will to dominate all life. And mm. that's at the very heart of Melkor's rebellion against Iluvatar in, in paradise, essentially, uh, as Satan rebels against God in Paradise Lost. It's, mm. it's very similar, Melkor, and uh, Sauron's lust for, for power is the same in that regard. So I, th I think that's a very clear connection. I guess another way you could also look at it, um, as an inversion of the incarnation, because uh, with the ring, Sauron pours his own being into this yeah. object, and it has its own agency. So it's not a perfect parallel of the of the incarnation, but there's that sort of idea going on here. With, yeah, with there's, definitely, there's definitely an element to it. I think um, ag again, I'd like to draw a comparison uh, between you know we're talk of course we're principally talking about the books but i'd like to draw a comparison between the um the consistency in the films and the books on the one hand you could almost say that the concept of the ring is benefited from the film's omission of tom bombadil because even though again tom bombadil is this primordial you know this ancient creature who is you know referred to as as old as um as old as treebeard Nevertheless, the fact that the ring has no power over him, regardless, it, it does sort of undermine the concept of, you know, the ring is all corrupting. However, um, in the film, I, I think it's important to note that Saruman's motives regarding the ring itself, I mean, his personal motives for survival and teaming up with Sauron are very clear, but his personal motives regarding what he's going to do with the ring when he capped, when he acquires it from, um, from the, um, the, the, the fellowship, whether he's going to keep it or give it to Sauron is never that clear in the film. But in the books, there is definitely this um, notion, this, this idea that there is an inner, inner conflict between the orcs allied to Saruman and the orcs allied to Sauron, especially at the beginning of the, twi at the, beginning of, um, the Twin Towers, and that Saruman would very much like to have the ring so he could depose Sauron. So again, this this consistent idea you, know, you mentioned on the idea that you know all, all power corrupts within the books. I think there's this idea that the ring could possibly serve another master other than Sauron and could in fact be used to usurp him. Where in the films, again, this falls down a bit. The fact that uh, as you know, um, we have with that famous bit, you know, there is only one Lord of the Ring and he does not share power. Um, if the ring can only serve Sauron, then it's not necessarily even a myth about. Um, total power but the desire for total power because you will never yourself achieve total power so i think in terms of the actual um consistency of the ring is also the fact that um with the hobbit as we mentioned the origins of the ring itself w weren't intended to be this grandiose um that there isn't necessarily this consistency in the idea of the ring and so as a result we will be having these um, discussions about it forever but i think um you know rather than making this um Unless you have anything else to add, uh, we'll probably get on to the um, the chronology of the Lord of the Rings itself. Well, well, just just to say on that point, just briefly, that Gandalf has a really good line in the books, which isn't included in the films, but I think it helps to understand what you've just said, is that Sauron in his is super intelligent and he can map out what he thinks the logical moves of the opposition are. And he expects them to come with power, with the ring, to take him on, essentially. That's what he expects Ilsia Dorzer to do. That's what he would do. However, yeah. uh, Gandalf points out, we don't want him, but that's not the problem. We don't want any master. We don't want anybody to take his place. We want to be free peoples. And he can't understand that. And that's at the heart of what the ring is about, is 
that's why he can't understand destroying it because he can't understand not having that sort of mastership over the, the world or somebody wanting that mastership over the world. Yes. And um, when it comes to Tolkien's interpretation of this, I think um, Chippy makes an error in referring to this as a fundamentally modern concept. Um, because uh, again, in terms of like total power, I mean, I've done streams on this myself regarding the conflict between the emperor and the papacy over the control of the spiritual and the temporal realms and this you know, desire to achieve power within Christendom itself. Um, I think what Tolkien is referring to is you know, much deeper than that, you know, rather than just having headship. I think Tolkien is referring to very much the totalitarianism that we see throughout the 20th century. And much of the um, books could be seen again, you know, in the purest reactionary light, not only, you know, um, a reaction against the themes of industrialization, which are, you know, so clear with Saruman, but also against the, the idea of, you know, the absolute totalizing power of, you know, the regimes in World War II, as opposed, again, you could say to the, the much more laissez-faire regimes of the Middle Ages. And again, as we go back to even before then, towards um, the transition of the Anglo-Saxons from paganism to Christianity, this idea of um, a, a free Volk, you know, a free people of the of, of the Rohirrim, essentially. So um, in, in terms of that concept, I think it's, you know, quite difficult really to nail down. And as we mentioned throughout the stream, there will be many sort of competing influences for this, but moving on, if that's all right. Um, so we start off with the chronology and I think, you know, frustratingly a bit probably about the Lord of the Rings is that it starts off really quite plodding and slow. Um, the Fellowship of the Ring, I will admit, is quite, the first part is quite um, a hard bit to get to. Um, and you could almost say that as with The Hobbit itself, it does self-plagiarize aspects of it in terms of the, the similar run to Elrond um, in Rivendell. And I think in terms, you know, other than um, other, other than sort of, um, we of course mentioned Tom Bombadil, um, you know, things like The Willow Man and The Barrows. I think, you know, these things don't really sort of add that much in terms of the, the grand scale of the books and the world building. Um, but one sort of interesting thing I, I did mention in terms of this, again, alluding to the fact that, um, Tolkien's work um, wasn't planned out um, was the fact that Aragorn was originally supposed to be a hobbit named Trotter, <laughs> which I which I never knew about before doing research onto this stream. I just I just like to imagine how the Lord of the Rings would have changed had that um this, had that change been made. That's going to be some weird fan fiction. Somebody's mm. probably written somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but but anyway, I think um. It, the sort of dividing point again is reaching the Council of Elrond. And the Council of Elrond is, you know, a very interesting device in the sense that it allows Tolkien to use, again, various forms of language to communicate, you know, the various motivations and um, the various cultures of, you know, whether they be the Gondorians, whether they be um, Gloin and, and, Glim and Gimli, um, whether they be um, Aragon, of course, representing the Dúnedain. And again, we talk about sort of anachronistic elements, you know, within the Council of Elrond scene, um, Boromir could be seen, you know, speaking quite a stultified, you know, alter variation of English. Um, and, you know, Aragon himself can almost lapse into some sort of, a, again, modern English. But I think um, the Council of Elrond is great at sort of expanding the world and again, expanding all the different motivations the races have um, towards this, you know, this great quest that will go on. In terms of sort of, again, building building the world beyond that, we've already mentioned the the origin of the elves. There is um, one point I want to get to, which is, of course, when we go through um, Moria and we arrive at the other end, I think, you know, in terms of Balrog and the, the creatures of Melkor, Morgoth, um, you know, I, I'd probably like to leave this to, to a stream on the Silmarillion specifically in terms of, you know, the original primordial creatures. We've already talked about um, the origins of the orcs. But um, when we reach, of course, um, Lothlorien uh, on the other side, and of course we have um, the death of Gandalf, and I, I don't think again it's it's quite obvious what the um, the inspiration is between the the death and the resurrection of Gandalf. But um, when we reach um, Lothlorien, I'd like to ask you because again, again, this is something that um, I would like to know more and have some sort of superficial understanding about, which is explaining the certain affinity between the elves and the forest. And again, you see this in the Sylvan Elves with um, Thranduil in Mirkwood as well. Mm -hmm. De definitely. Although I think the, there is a distinction that needs to be drawn in terms of the the, the elves of um, Mirkwood, so Thranduil's elves, uh, they have always lived in that part of the world. Or mm. it, 
Middle Earth. They never went to Valinor, mm. whereas uh, the elves of Lothlorien, is, well, Galadriel, uh, not her husband, interestingly, but Galadriel, she ca- she was in Valinor and then came back with mm. uh, with Feanor, and we'll get into that in the Cimmerillion, I suppose. But um, so her her affinity comes from the paradise in Valinor, which uh, the gardens there are Lorien. So it's being recreated in Middle Earth as Lothlorien, almost. Mm. It's, a, it's a shadow of the splendor of Valinor. Um, and this connection is tied up with, um, also with the ring that she has. It gives her the power to kind of sustain that land mm. and keep it in its bubble. And that magic from with the ring is uh, tied into to, to nature in this regard. And so with the fading of the rings comes the fading of kind of the magical natural world, which are one and the same thing for Tolkien. Hmm. Um, so I, I think there, there's the connection really is, um, well, I, I should also say that the Valar who, um, again, I don't want to get too much into, but it's helpful for answering the question. The Valar are each are tied to various aspects of the world and cultivating the world. And so you have certain ones which cultivated the guardian, the gardens of Lorien or Lauren in, uh, in Valinor. Hmm. So the elves like Galadriel are somewhat c- continuing that strand. They are kind of the agents now uh, stewarding the natural world in Middle Earth. So I, th- I think that's a deep connection there hmm. within the world at least. No, no, wonderful, and thank you for that um, that allusion again. When it comes to the elves in particular, because again, the one of the overarching themes, as Nathan has mentioned, is the the idea of you know general decline and the, the passing of time. And we'll be able to really focus on the the elves in our Silmarillion stream. But again, again, when we talk about the elves in the Third Age, it very much is considered to be some sort of afterthought or the last remainder before they finally part the waves and return to the West. Um, when it comes to the um, again our, our next sort of inspiration i have a passage here because of course the chronology of, of course is that um they leave lothlorien uh they travel down the um the Anduil, and um they are ambushed by the urukai at um, um in the service of saruman at amon hen and that is where we have the um the breaking of the fellowship and this is where the um the party led by you know Le- legolas gimli and um uh, legolas gimli and aragon uh begin to arrive at the, the borders of the mark. And this is where I'd really like to talk about um, Rohan. When it comes to Boromir, yes, we will. Uh, I will get back to Boromir when we're talking about um, uh, Gondor in particular, which will f- follow on chron- chronologically after Rohirrim. But if, if I may, um, there's about sort of five pages here where he, um, Tom Shippey really goes into depth regarding the, um, the kingdom of Rohan and what it really represents. And um, if you, because again, it's quite, you know, five pages. If you'd like to um, make any sort of contributions, just say pause and um, I'll stop and um, let you elaborate. Go for it. I'm any one of Tolkien's tableau was stand analysis and the obvious one to choose is perhaps Gondor. However, I prefer to start with the riders of Rohan, not the first children of Tolkien's imagination, but the ones he regarded with most affection and also in a sense, the most central. In creating them, Tolkien was once again playing with his own background and his own home in the little kingdom. Thus, Rohan is only the Gondorian word for the rider's country. They themselves call it the Mark. Now, there is no English county called the Mark, but the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, which included both Tolkien's hometown, Birmingham, and his alma mater, Oxford, was Mercia, a Latinism now adopted by historians, mainly because the native term was never recorded. However, the West Saxons called their neighbors the Murky, clearly a um, a derivation from Meac, the Mercians' own pronunciation. Of that would certainly have been the mark, and there was no doubt once that every, that was once an everyday town for central England. As for the white horse on the green field, which is the emblem of the mark, you can see it cut into the chalk 50 miles from Tolkien's study, two miles from Wayland Smithy, and just on the borders of Mercia and Wessex, as if to mark the kingdom's end. All the riders' names and the language are Old English, as many have noted, but they were homely to Tolkien in an even deeper sense than that. As has already been remarked, though the riders, according to Tolkien, did not resemble the ancient English, except in a general way, 
due to the circumstances, a simpler, more primitive people living in contact with higher and more venerable culture and occupying lands that had once been part of his domain. Tolkien was stretching the truth a long way and asserting that to say the least. But there is one obvious difference between the people of Rohan and the ancient English, and that is the horses. The Rohirrim called themselves Eotheot, Eoth or Peod, people, horse people. This translates into common speech as the riders. Rohan itself is Sindarin for house horse country. Prominent riders called themselves after horses, Eomond, Eomer, and Eowen. And their most important title after king is Marshal, borrowed into English from French, but going back to an unrecorded Germanic, Marshal Scalotts, horse servant. The Rohirrim are nothing if not cavalry. By contrast, the Anglo-Saxons' reluctance to have anything militarily to do with horses is notorious. The Battle of Malden begins significantly enough, with the horses being sent to the rear. Hastings was lost along with the Anglo-Saxon independence, largely because the English heavy infantry could not quite hold off the combination of archers and mounted knights. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle entry for 1055 remarks sourly that the Hereford, before a spear was thrown, the English fled because they had been made to fight on horseback. How then can Anglo-Saxon and Rohirrim ever be culturally equated? And this is, you know, we're leading on to one of the um, fascinating themes about Tolkien's inventiveness and his own fascination with Gothic in particular. A part of the answer is that the Rohirrim are not to be equated with the Anglo-Saxons of history, but with those of poetry or legend. The chapter, The King of the Golden Hall, is straightforwardly Calact on Beowulf. When Legolas says, Megiseld, the light of it shines far over the land, he is translating line 311 of Beowulf, Dixte se leomne ofe lamdefella. Megiseld is indeed a Beowulfian word for hall. More importantly, the poem and the chapter agree down to the minute detail on the procedure for approaching kings. In Beowulf, the hero is stopped first by a coast guard, then by a doorward, and only after two challenges approach to um, uh, is after two challenges is allowed to approach the Danish king. He and his men have to pile arms outside as well. Tolkien follows this dignified step-by-step -step ceremonial process exactly. Thus, in the King of the Golden Hall. Gandalf, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli are checked first by the guards at the gates of Edoras, and by that extension, that word means enclosures, and then by the doorward of Mediseld. Hammer, he too insists on the ceremony of piling arms, though Tolkien's characters object more than Beowulf does, largely because he is a volunteer, and in any case fights by choice barehanded. There is a crisis over Gandalf's staff, indeed, and Hammer brews reflecting rightly that the staff and hand of a wizard may become more than the prop for age. He settles his doubts with the maxim, yet in doubt a man of worth will trust to his own wisdom. I believe you are friends and folk of honour, who have no evil purpose. You may go in. In saying so, he echoes the maxim of the Coast Guard of Beowulf. A sharp shield warrior must know how to tell good from bad in every case, from words as well as deeds. I hear you that this is, this is a friendly war band. I will guide you. The point is not, though, that Tolkien is once more writing a Calac narrative but that he is taking advantage of a modern expansive style to spell out things that would have been obvious to Anglo-Saxons in particular. The truths that freedom is not a prerogative of democracies and that in free societies, orders give way to discretion. Hammer takes risk with Gandalf and so the Coast Guard with Beowulf. So does Eomer with Aragorn, letting him go free and lending him horses. He is under arrest when Aragorn reappears and Theoden notes Hammer's dereliction of duty too. Still, the nice thing about the riders, one might say, is that though a stern people loyal to their lord, they wear a duty and loyalty lightly. Hammer and Eomer make their own decisions, and even the suspicious Gatewall wishes Gandalf luck. I was only obeying orders. We can see it would not be accepted as an excuse in the Riddermark, nor would it in Beowulf. The wisdom of ancient epic is translated by Tolkien into a whole sequence of doubts, decisions, sayings, and rituals. One could go further and say the riders spring from poetry, not history, and the whole of their culture is based on song. Almost the first thing Gandalf and the others see, nearing Medjuseld, are the mounds covering the Silbamine, either side of the way. Silbamine is a little word for white flower, or ever so ever mind or ever memory, forget me not. Like the barrows, it stands for the preservation of the memory of ancient deeds and heroes in the expanse of years. The riders are fascinated by memorial verse and oblivion, by deaths and by epitaphs. 
they show it in their list of kingly pedigrees, from Theoden back to Eor the young, in the suicidal urges of Eoma and Eowyn to do deeds of song, in the song that Aragorn sings to set the tone of the culture he is visiting. Where now the horse and the rider? Where is the horn that was blowing? Where is the helm and the hauberk and the bright hair flowing? Most of all, it comes over the alliterative dirges made for Theoden by Gleowini, for the dead of Pelennor by an anonymous maker, even in the rhyming couplet made by the horse Snowmane. These preserve the sonority, the sadness, the feeling for violent opposites, death day, lords, lowly, hall, pastures, integrated in the rider's language and culture. Their visual correlatives, one might say, are the spears planted in burial mounds by Fangorn and at the fords of Isen, or perhaps the spears of the men and the mounds of poems for Aema says of one burial, when their spears have rotted and rusted, long still their mounds stay and guard the fords of Isen. The men die and their weapons rust, but their memory passes, it remains, the forget-me-not, the evermind, the oral heritage of the race. Do you have anything to say? I, I, do, I do understand that I've been talking quite a lot, but nevertheless, I think it's quite an interesting passage to go through. Yeah, that's, uh, there's just so much there. I guess the, the first thing, just to tie it in with a lot of what we've been talking about, is he mentioned how decay, essentially, that although this is a proud culture uh, with long-held traditions, in the character of Theoden and with the way the hall had been, there'd been decline from that. And Eomer and Eowyn desire to return to those glory days. And it's something that hangs over Theoden very much until the end of his life. That he's not lived up to the great heroes of old. And that connects it, I think, very well with uh, the the elves, for example, that we were talking about, decay with them too. Hmm. As we mentioned, I mean, as I mentioned um, earlier, I, I wanted to say that passage just because I think it sums up again the continuity between the Anglo-Saxon tradition and that of the um, the invented Rohirrim. However, as we mentioned with the word um, the mark, and again, this being some sort of um, mythologized version of um, Mercia, I'll, I'll sum up some of the other points um, he makes. Again, these these aren't um, original assessments by me by any means. Um, talking about his love of philology, the word, the etymology of horsa, of course, means horse or stallion. Horsa Hengis being the you know mythological founders of um, the Anglo-Saxons. And it's almost as if, again, the, the illusion is, because the etymology is there, that one can justify this alternative history where, despite, as he mentions, the fact that the real Anglo-Saxons had no um, pedigree when it came to um, cavalry riding at all. In fact, you know, they would always favor the, um, to, to fight on foot, you know, throughout their history. Um, nevertheless, because the etymology is there, it gives it some sort of legitimacy. And so, Again, again, this is also defined by the geography as well. Um, Mercia, of course, you know, being on the island of Great Britain, um, there isn't, again, so much of an impetus for having to learn the ways of horsemanship. However, Tolkien's greatest fascination, other than that of the Anglo-Saxons themselves, was with the Goths. Now, I have, no, I think, I think I'll get up an image of um, Middle Earth just to, um, to show you what I mean. When, when talking about the, the geography here, because I think this is quite significant to talk about. Okay, so here we have a map of Rohan in the center, as you can see. Um, when it comes to the Rohirrim, of course, you know, this is very much a landlocked country, and to the east you can see the open plain, and um, Ravanion, Ravanion, of course, to the north. Um, when it comes to you know the historical illusions of this territory, um, there's nothing really resembling England at all in terms of the geography here. Um, Shippy himself argues that this area is actually based on modern day Ukraine. So the area east of the Carpathian Mountains. So if we are going to ascribe the Misty Mountains as you know the Carpathian borders, you know, which used to be the natural boundaries of Hungary. And then to the east we have you know the rolling step towards Crimea and towards Russia. And here when we have Mirkwood, um, you could say that this is an allusion to the dark woods of the river Dnieper. And you can say, even though I believe that um, the Andouille is um, 
an inspiration again of the Danube in some instances. I think it's also inspired by the river Dnieper, which is the central river in Ukraine, which runs up, you know, all the way to um, to Belarus. So here you can almost say that we have this Anglo-Saxon um, synthesis with the ancient Gothic peoples who, of course, you know, are great horse riders. And um, in terms of sort of the etymology we'll sort of get into, this will sort of bleed into um, our assessment of Gondor. You know, of course, um, one of the central points that we get to the return of the king is the fact that um, the Rohirrim would be instrumental in lifting the siege of um, Minas Tirith. And this is, you know, really something I want to get back to in terms of the, the rich inspiration behind this, in terms of, you know, the, the historical inspiration. Um, it's quite clear that elements of the Battle of Pelennor Fields were inspired by um, uh, Jordana's description of the Battle of the Catalonian Plains between um, the Romans and Attila the Hun in, I think, the year 450. And the interesting thing about that, of course, the general we, we all remember is Aetius fighting on the Roman side. Um, they were also assisted by the Gothic king, Theodorix. Uh, the fascinating thing about the etymology of that is that rakes is the gothic word for king so it becomes theodore king theoden king who was slain at the battle of um, the catalonian plains as opposed to theoden king who was slain at the battle of the pelennor fields um again trying to uh, wrap this all together one of the things that sort of really confused me though i mean other than this being um an ode to um tolkien's absolute love of um the Gothic culture and the fact he would, you know, ruminate a lot about the loss of the Gothic culture towards the end of the 15th century. Um, how does one reconcile the relationship between Gondor and Rohan, even if one takes a rather superficial look? We'll get into the inspirations later because it's really quite complex. But take a superficial example that Gondor is just um, an imitation of the dying Roman Empire, say, for example, uh, and the Goths, you know, despite, you know, despite helping um, the Romans at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, there would also be fierce adversaries throughout this period. And um, I was thinking, you know, how does one reconcile this? Well, the last vestige of the Goths were, of all places, they were um, in Crimea, uh, modern-day Crimea, which is now, of course, part of Russia, um, the Principality of Theodoro, who were the last vassals of the Emperor of Trebizond, who was himself the, you could say, the last emperor of the Roman Empire. So you could say, you know, the last vassal were the Goths and again of the of the Roman Emperor. So there is some sort of tenuous historical link that you can draw between this um, system of vassalage of Rohan and Gondor and trying to, again, bring Rohan into some sort of grand sort of Gothic history. Because again, um, it doesn't really exist if you just look at it as a history of the Mark or a history of Mercia. Um, but again, that's probably ridiculous, and you'll probably like to um, to add something to that. Uh, not much. Uh, that's a really good summary. I think the only thing I would add is in The Lord of the Rings, there is a rumour uh, that's quickly dispelled that Rohan are sending horses to Mordor, and that perhaps this is an allusion to the Goths having an adversarial relationship at points with Rome, mm. that they're dangerous and they're not just tied in to to Gondor, the Ro the Rohirrim, they have their own culture, and they're not take shouldn't be taken lightly, and they could, in theory, mm. flip flip. So it's perhaps perhaps that's part of it, the instability yes. of that relationship. Yes, but I think you know, I think there is something to be said about my tenuous comparison between um the Goths yeah. in Crimea and um the dying days of the Byzantine Empire. But, oh, I um, loved it. It was great. <laughs> but, um, and as you mentioned, there, there is, I would say, there is a very different um, ethnogonic history between Rohan and Gondor. And I really sort of like to, to get into Gondor and discuss like, in, in terms of also the, the themes and the significance of what Gondor represents. So, um, again, summing up, of course, the chronology as we go through the two towers, um, we have um, the Battle of Helm's Deep, of course. and throughout this process this again this is something i really would like um your contributions on nathan which is the the symbolism of the ents because of course the ents play a significant role in the demise of saruman and and again on the one hand we have the the liberation of the mark from the um 
the constant raids by the the uh, the evil men, the Dunlanders, and um, in alliance with Saruman and the Orcs. But um, in in terms of this physical revolt of the natural environment of the ancient order against the, you know, the the mechanized um, industrialized Isengard, would you like to elaborate on that? There's not much more to say. I think in some ways, uh, so the Ents are a personification of nature, and they are the stewards of nature. I think that's an important point. They they are the shepherds of the very dangerous forest, and it's by their hand the forest is either kept in bay or let loose. Saruman, in his arrogance and pride, forgets the danger of the natural world, um, which is not just seen in the trees. It's seen in the mountains. Uh, we passed over it, but uh, Kahadras is literally repels the fellowship. Yes, the natural world has power. Absolutely. And Tolkien wanting us to focus back in on that, and the Ents. Um, so Saruman uh, is basically using the wood of Fangorn to fuel his fires mm. and to create this mechanized society, very much like the society Tolkien would have grown grown up with, it, particularly around Mosley. I would I would add. In Birmingham, there was great industrialization taking place, and this lovely green area that he grew up in was slowly being eradicated through industry. And there's actually, I'll, I'll post it in the chat, there's um, Edgebaston Reservoir, there's a tower very much like Orthanc, and it's a big basin filled with water there, um, which, uh, which you can see, I hope, soon. Um, and uh, so he, this is very much his own experience and the Ents are nature revolting against that and overthrowing it. And I think that's quite a, um, a challenging lesson for us really in terms of the, you know, we think industry is going to, to, to win out, but actually Tolkien's like, no, nature's going to win and you're going to be humbled at some point, humanity, on this. Absolutely. Even though, again, um, Saruman is, it's not, again, this isn't, of course, as we can see during the map, the areas, you know, where um, we have Manish activity or, you know, even former Manish activity, like up here in Eriador, even though the population is very much dispersed at this point. Um, Saruman, of course, being an Istari, being one of the, um, the later Maya to come to Middle Earth, you know, as representatives of Valinor, you know, very much they they betray their purpose. And again, this is coming to this idea of, you know, constant biblical themes of illusions back to Lucifer. Um, in terms of sort of moving the chronology on from here, you know, we'll get up to the, um, the Siege of Minas Tirith later and sort of elaborate on that, that point I made. And other inspirations I'd like to draw from that, because I don't believe it really stops there. But um, the Hobbits in particular, they um, pass through um, the Dead Marshes after having been separated at the Amon Hen, having passed through Emmemuel. And um, one inspiration I thought is, again, going back to my, my stream on Monday, if people want to check it out on Ancient Germania, is um, the bog bodies or the sacrificial practices of the pagans in Jutland and Mecklenburg and Lower Saxony of that of um, again sometimes willingly sometimes not but sacrificing bodies in in the bogs and um leaving them there you know relatively preserved like toland man yet one can't help but draw some sort of you know allusion to um pagan um, germanic sacrifices and the dead marshes but um they pass through you know they they get to the black gate and of course they have to turn around and they pass through the lands of Ithilien. Okay. Okay, we've lost um, we've lost we lost Nathan. So I'll I'll continue speaking. Hopefully, he'll, he'll come back in a bit. Um, we see the um, hobbits pass through into the lands of Ithilien, and um, this is where, of course, they have their first interaction with the Gondorians, being that of um, Faramir and his um, his rangers of Ithilien. At the same time we have the Rohirrim marshalling for war at the same time that Gandalf has been brought back to Minas Tirith with Pippin and he is again ingratiated into the the fountain guard in the service of the um Stuart Denethor and we're back <laughs> were you able to hear what I was um what I was saying no I missed it all sorry about that all right well just a quick summary of you know the chronology you know uh, Pippin is um now in the service of Denethor the hobbits are now in Athelion, and um, 
the rest of the fellowship are again in Rohan mustering for war after the beacons have been lit. And I think you know this gets to the um the the history of Gondor, you know, which I really want to sort of elaborate on because in a way it's much more complex than Rohan. You can say there isn't such a um a direct inspiration, which is so obvious that in Rohan being, of course, the synthesis of the Gothic and the the Anglo-Saxon cultures of Mercia. Um Gondor, of course, is the descendant of uh, Numenor and, and you know the the compare the you can almost say the allegory there is most obvious um when Tolkien is writing about the fall of Numenor which is the you know destruction of the city Atlantis because it offended the gods um the Numenorians then arrive on the shores of um, Gondor and many are um enslaved to the cause of Sauron and then of course you know we have the the war of the last alliance which um the King Elendil, the Numenorean King Elendil wins. And there, at the beginning of the first age, we have the establishment of the um, kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor. Now, in terms of trying to like understand the, the greatest significance of this, um, I would recommend to the chat that you read Evola um, and think as you're reading Evola as to how this pertains to the conception of an idealized fantasy setting, essentially. Because many of the themes you'll see in Tolkien crossover into Evola. And this is a interesting passage I have from Evola, which is in a lesser known book, which is the Hermetic Tradition, which is talking about the um, symbolism of the Tree of Life. So at the beginning of the Kingdom of Gondor after Sauron is defeated originally, and Elendil comes back and he plants the, um, the first white tree of Gondor, um, I really want to sort of go into the significance of the tree. It's only two pages, but I think it's worth reading nevertheless. In the Vedas and the Upanishads, we find the world tree, inverted sometimes suggests the origin of its power in the heights, in the heavens. Here we discover a real convergence of many elements and ideas. From this tree drips the nectar of immortality, Soma or Amrita, and whoever sips it is inspired with a vision beyond the reaches of time a vision that awakens the memory of all the infinite forms of existence. In the foliage of the tree hides Yama, the god of beyond, the grave, whom we also know as the king of the primordial state. In Iran, we also find the tradition of the double tree, one of which comprises, according to the Bundashesh, all seeds, while the other is capable of furnishing the drink of immortality and spiritual knowledge, which leads us immediately to think again of the two biblical trees of paradise, the one of life and the other of knowledge. The first, then, is the equivalent to the representation of the kingdom of heaven, sprouts from the seed irrigated by the man, the symbolic field. We encounter it again in the Apocalypse of John, and especially in the Kabbalah, as the great and powerful tree of life, by which life is raised on high, and which is connected a sprinkling by virtue of which is produced the resurrection of the dead, a patent equivalent to the power of immortality in the Vedic Amrita and the Iranian Hamoa. Assyrian Babylonian mythology also recognizes a cosmic tree, Rushad and Eridu, the house of profundity or the house of wisdom. What is important to recognize in these traditions, because this element, sorry, we seem to have lost Nathan again, but what is important to recognize in these traditions, because this element will be useful in what follows, is another association of symbols. The tree also represents for us the personification of the divine mother of that same type of those associated with the Asiatic goddesses of nature, Ishtar, Anat, Tammuz, Sibyl, and so forth. We find then the idea of a feminine nature of the universal force represented by the tree. This idea is not only confirmed by the goddess consecrated to the Duma Oak, which besides being a place of oracles, is also a fountain of spiritual knowledge, but also by the Hesperides who are charged with guarding the tree, whose fruit has the same symbolic value as the golden fleece and the same immortalizing power as the tree of the Irish legend of Magmel, also guarded by a feminine entity. In the Ada, and again, the Ada, the poetic Ada being so central to um, Tolkien's mythology, it is the goddess Ithun who is charged with guarding the apples of immortality. While in the cosmic tree, Igadstril, again, we encounter the central symbol rising before the mountain of Mimir, guarding it reintroducing the symbol of the dragon at the root of the tree, which contains the principle of all wisdom. Finally, according to a Slavic saga on the island of Bajan, there is an oak guarded by a dragon, which we must associate with the biblical serpent, with the monsters of Jason's adventures, and with the garden of Hesperides, that simultaneously is the residence of a feminine principle, the Virgin of Dawn. Also rather interesting is the variation according to which the tree appears to us as the dominion of the universal empire, 
such as we find in the legends, like those of Holger and Prester John, whom we have mentioned elsewhere. In these legends, the tree is often dubbed the tree of the sun and the tree of the moon. Hermeticism repeats the same primordial symbolic tradition and the same association of ideas, and the symbol of the tree is quite prevalent in alchemical texts. The tree shelters the fountain of Bernard of Treviso, in which center is the symbol of the dragon, Uboros, who represents the all. It personifies Mercury, either as the first principle of the Hermetic Opos, equivalent to the divine water or water of life that gives resurrection to the dead and illuminates the son of Hermes, or else it represents the lady of the philosophers, but it also represents the dragon, that is a dissolving pulse, a power that kills. The tree, the sun, and the tree of the moon are also hermetic symbols, sometimes producing crowns in the place of fruits. This quick glance at the stuff of religion, which we could expand on indefinitely, is enough to establish the permanence and universality of a tradition of vegetable symbolism, expressing the universal force predominantly in the feminine form. This symbolism is the repository of a supernatural science of a force capable of giving immortality and dominion, but at the same time warns of multiple danger that complicates the myth in terms of various purposes, different truths and visions. In general, the danger is the same to anyone, runs in seeking the conquest of immortality or enlightenment. By contacting the universal force, the one who makes contact must, capable, must be capable of withstanding overwhelming grandeur. But we also know myths in which there are heroes who confront the tree, and divine natures in the Bible, God himself is hypostasized that defend and impede access to it. And the result then is a battle variously interpreted according to the traditions. There is a double possibility in one case. The tree is conceived as temptation, which leads to ruin and damnation for anyone who succumbs to it. The other, it is conceived as an object of possible conquest, after which dealing with the dragons or divine beings, defending it, transforms the dera into a god and sometimes transfers the attributes of divinity or, or immortality from one race to another. Thus the knowledge that tempted Adam to become as god and that he attained only by immediately being knocked down and deprived of the tree of life, by the very being with whom he had hoped to equalize himself. Now, I think the significance is incredibly clear, and I'll wait for um, Nathan to come back. Hopefully, he will be come back, so he won't just have to listen to me monologuing for the rest of the stream. But I think the significance is clear, especially when we see in the conquest on the destruction of the tree, that we have a tree which is you know rich in this incredible um, biblical I get again idea with the original corruption of man, but also as the tree of life as representing the dominion and not just um, any dominion, the dominion of man and the civilization of the Numenorians itself as beginning this new civilization anew. And the symbolic conquest of this tree by Sauron would essentially rep rep represent the transition of some sort of universal sovereignty, universal dominion to that of Sauron himself. And again, bringing this back to the idea that the tree represents some sort of parallel with the ring itself, where you have the original fall, where one wants to equalize and usurp the position of God. In the case of the Lord of the Rings universe, this would be um, again, followed up by Melkor as well, and possibly even by Saruman had the, had the plot of the Lord of the Rings gone a different way, which is um, the usurpation of Iluvatar. And in this case, it would mean the dominion of all Middle Earth as represented by holding that tree, the white tree of Gondor. So as you can see, there is absolutely significant, in, uh, wonderful, we have Nathan, <laughs> you're back. You, sa you sadly missed, um, unless you were listening, um, the, the analysis given by Evola. But essentially, um, the tree represents temptation. It represents some sort of equivalency with um, the ring. It harkens back to the original fall of Adam, but it also represents um, dominion, and in this case, dominion of man, but also the, again, the roots of all civilization, I think. Nathan? Sorry, I cut out for a while, so I don't know how much I missed of what you had just said. Um, I think technology was all right, I think we've, we, yeah. I, I don't have much to add. Okay, well, um, all right. Well, I, I thought it was an interesting point regardless in terms, again, just um, bringing Evola into this and trying to see this as part, not just of a, um, a particular tradition to the um, Anglo-Saxons, of course, you know, a European tradition for which um, uh, Tolkien himself was well-versed, but this, in fact, represents a universal tradition, the significance, the biblical significance of the tree itself, the tree of life. 
and the significance of the Gondorians and how this is both you know, the inception of the new Gondorian civilization post the fall of Numenor, post the last alliance, and how this was a symbol of conquest by Sauron and how taking this tree would not only represent again the the end of the dominion of man and the beginning of his dominion but represents some sort of parallel with the ring and um the original fall um you know as with um the tree of knowledge and the tree of life in um in paradise but sort of moving on from that because <laughs> I don't want to linger too much on that um on that point is um when talking about Gondor of course we've um also mentioned that Gondor has some similarities to the Roman Empire. And I feel that this comparison is rather superficial. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, um, the the overall reasoning for it. Of course, you know, Gondor represents um, the height of human civilization. And in terms of, again, trying to, this is primarily a historical channel, trying to bring this back to historical inspiration. Um, when we have the establishment of the Kingdom of Men by Elendil, there are two kingdoms, not just one. We have Gondor, which is ruled by the House of Aenor, which is the younger son of Elendil. And we have Arnor, which is going to be inherited by the House of Isildur, who of course is the um, the second son of, uh, sorry, the first son of um, Elendil. Um, I think you can see that there is some sort of comparison with this. I, I would draw the, you know, in terms of if Elendil is to be any Roman emperor, I'd probably say he represents Constantine. But you could also say that he represents Theodosius because Theodosius, is able to definitively divide the Roman Empire between his two sons, Arcadius and Honorus, Honorius. And you can see that in the division of the empire itself. And of course, the allusions to Arnor being some sort of um, representative of the Western Roman Empire, you know, there the are quite a lot of influences. The fact that um, it collapses politically, it divides, as we see, you know, throughout the crisis of the third century, even though this will be before the, the eventual, you know, terminal decline, that um, the Western Roman Empire was split off into the Gallic Empire. In the case of Tolkien and um, the Tolkien Legendarium, this would be the, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the division of Arnor into the kingdom of Rudar, uh, the kingdom of um, Cardolan and um, Athedian. Am I, am I correct there? I think the so, three yeah. um, the three mm -hmm. successive kingdoms of Arnor, which would eventually be um, Rudar would be assimilated into um, Angmar, and Angmar would um, lead the conquest of Arnor itself, and therefore we have you, the symbolic you know loss of um, the Western Roman Empire. Um, Tolkien himself would refer to um, Arthur Dane. Thank you, um, JD in the chat. Um, Tolkien himself would refer to Minas Tirith as a Byzantine history, uh, as a Byzantine city, and. I mean, if you just look at it, um, just get up the image here. Um, this, of course, is the Tolkien uh, is the adaptation by um, by Peter Jackson in the films. Um, I really don't get that much of a, especially just in the geography, regardless of the actual design of the city itself, which you know could be seen as you know um, rather Jacksonian rather than um, that of Tolkien. Um, the geography itself lends nothing to the idea that this is some sort of Byzantine city, or this has some sort of comparison with Byzantium itself, because it's so departed again from the water, which is, you know, so significant. I mean, my own reading of um, the significance of Minas Tirith is that it could be an allusion to several things. You know, one, of course, is an allusion to the city of Rome. One, of course, is an allusion to Jerusalem that Gondor and the Numenorians represent some sort of Christian civilization. And this is, you know, in, in terms of the influence, and as, as we see Middle Earth as an extension of language and language play, um, the, um, I think the language is um, Aduniac, um, Aduniac or something, uh, uh, the Numenorian language. Um, there are Semitic influences, especially in the uh, calligraphy, which, you know, very much looks um, Hebrew. We have um, inspiration, of course, from the Germanic aspect, and um, we have, um, again, obvious allusions to Rome. But nevertheless, I mean, in, in terms of sort of uh, pitting this down, you know, I, I really see very little of ancient Rome or Greece represented in the culture. I mean, one interesting thing to note is there are obvious Germanic influences in the, um, the death of Boromir. For example, the um, the funeral pyre on the boat. You know, again, very much reminiscent of the Norse sagas that there is a Germanic element to this kingdom. But on the other hand, talking about the Semitic influences, um, on the one hand, we have the the fall of Numenor. Um, Evola would regard this as some sort of um, 
fusion between the um, Western influences and Northern influences, the Atlantic civilization versus the Hyperborean civilization. But I think that's a bit too complicated, really, to get into that much depth on the um, on the stream. But um, to say, you know, one one could draw the comparison between uh, the you know the fall of Numenor and that being like the fall of Troy. And this being, you know, the um, the passage of Aeneas, the Iliad, and the creation of the city of Rome. But I think, you know, one could also draw, you know, if we're going to go the Semitic route, that this could be, as we see with the great seafaring tradition of the Numenorians, that there could be some sort of, you know, Punic or Carthaginian influence there. And that's very much as we have, you know, the, the the departing of Aeneas. On the other side, we have the departing of Queen Dido. And this could represent some sort of, again, Punic retreat. In terms of this building upon the Semitic influence from Gondor, you know, the Phoenicians and um, the Carthaginians is one aspect. But another one I'd like to draw is that it being a allusion to a Christian civilization as a whole. And by that, I would refer to it as being an allegory to some extent of the kingdom of Israel. And the sort of the inspiration I have for this is the fact that unlike in Roman history, we have a very long period of of Middle Earth history, where Gondor is ruled by the House of Hurin, who are the House of Stuarts. Now, this there's no real equivalent in Roman imperial history. You know, after the um, after the creation of the empire, where this happens, where you have the fall of the king, essentially. You know, the end of the um, the House of Ainur and the dissolution of Arnor. Um, so what does, wh wh where does one draw the inspiration? You know, one could say that Elendil or Isildur is some sort of allusion to King David and, you know, by extension, the corruption of King Solomon. And that as with the Kingdom of Israel, um, Israel itself, again, split into two kingdoms like, you know, Arnor and Gondor. And much of um, you know Jewish messianic tradition, the Jewish prophecy, which of course is so entwined with Christianity, is out of waiting for a Messiah, or in some cases, waiting for the return of the King after the House of Kings has fallen, after the House of David has fallen. And you could almost say that it's been usurped by this lesser house, you know, this paranoid house, which is almost to the point of making an alliance with the enemy. You, we one could even draw a comparison with Herod the Great and um, Denethor. And again, goes totally mad and you know starts um, starts um, seeing threats everywhere. So, and of course, Aragon being the typified um, messianic figure, you know, the return of the king. Um, do you think I'm reading too much into that, or I'm, I'm missing something there in terms I of the just, illusions? I, th I think I could just add one thing that would maybe confirm what you've just said. Actually, is that if you look at the New Jerusalem in Revelation, it's a city with seven levels. And I think Minas Tirith is a city with seven levels. So there's mm. definitely um, an identification there with Jerusalem and not yet fulfilled until the king returns. So, I th yeah, I think what you've laid out makes a lot of sense. Interesting. So I, I think, um, you know, in terms of sort of building upon this influence, I really want to get up to the, you know, chronology of... Um, Lord of the Rings, and, and this is where it gets even more complicated, and I'm going to draw in <laughs> even more influences um, from Gondor. So I'll get this image up a second. Now, this is a visualization of, no, no, not obviously the um, the film visualization, but a visualization of Minas Ithil. Now, just to you know give you a quick chronology after you know we, we arrive at Gondor and Return of the King, um, the beginning of the invasion of Gondor by Mordor commences here at a Minas Ithil, which is um, transformed by the Witch King of Angmar into Minas Morgul. And from here, we commence the invasion of Osgiliath and the siege of um, Minas Tirith, and eventually the, um, the Battle of Pelennor Fields. Now, in terms of, I was really trying to wrap my head around this because I, I, on the one hand, you know, we've mentioned the fact, that you, I mean, you've drawn that brilliant illusion between, you know, Minister for the New Jerusalem as being more pertinent than that of a Roman equivalent. Um, I really want to sort of move beyond there as well and say there is another historical illusion, not necessarily a, a theological illusion to that, which is 1683, um, the Turkish um, attempt to conquer Vienna. And um, I, I think I have quite a lot to substantiate this. Um, as you know, the diehard Tolkien fans in the chat will know, Minas Tirith wasn't the original capital of Gondor. The original capital was Osgiliath. And 
to, to my mind, if there is to be such, you know, focus um, placed on the city of Minas Tirith, the city of the guard, it doesn't really make any much sense as to why Tolkien would choose Osgiliath to also be the capital of Gondor. And as we know, in the beginning of the first stage, um, Ithilien, which is on the east bank of the Anduil, was also held by the Gondorians and most of Mordor. In fact, most of the construction of Mordor was Gondorian. And then you see the slow conquest of that region as the regime in Gondor declines by the forces of Mordor. And I, I really want to focus here at Minas Ithil because, of course, the etymology of Ithilien is, I think, land of the moon. And so um, Minas Ithil will be the city of the moon. Now, dispelling the idea that Minas Tirith could really be Constantinople as opposed to, you know, some sort of allusion to Jerusalem or something else, the symbol of Constantinople was the moon, the crescent moon. And of course, it was conquered in 1453 by the Turks, and the moon was then appropriated to be the crescent moon of Islam. And so we have at the beginning of Minas Ithil, the beginning of the conquest or would-be conquest of Minas Tirith, starting from the city of the moon, i.e. Constantinople, i.e. Istanbul. And they moved to take Osgiliath. Now, Osgiliath is situated on the Anduil. Why is it such a significant city? Why is it um, a potential capital? Because I think it represents possibly an allusion to the old city of Budapest, um, the capital of Hungary. And that, it, again, being the capital of the Kingdom of Hungary, which was, you know, destroyed by um, kind of, again, like um, like Angmar, destroyed and um, ripped into pieces um, by the Turks at the, after the Battle of Mohash. So from this base at Budapest, the old capital, they go and attack Vienna, Vienna being the capital of the Holy Roman Empire, the capital of the House of Habsburg, the center of the Manish dominion or the Christian dominion in Europe after the fall of the original city of Constantinople, or in this case would be the uh, Minas Ithil, which again was a city bordering the Alps, you know, just before the, um, even the geography looks quite similar if you were to um, plop Vienna on a map and compare it at the end of the, at the, end of the Alps. And from there, we have the attempted siege. And of course, we have the failure of that siege. And th this is why, again, I think it plays into the chronology. Um, and at Pelennor Fields, of course, um, we have the Gondorians or the Holy Alliance. Uh, again, this isn't just um, you know, the, the, the Austrians fighting. This is a Holy Alliance of you know, most you know, factions of the Holy Roman Empire fighting against the common enemy. In this case, it will be the Turks. And again, the Turks aren't just, you know, represented by themselves but they also form various alliances with you know among other groups such as the um the crimeans and you know of course it's a multi-ethnic empire and this could be seen as a coalition um as exemplified in lord of the ring between the haradin and the easterlings and the barbary corsairs of course i think it's obvious that that is an allusion to the um the barbary corsairs the course you know of um north africa of algeria of tunisia which again were vassals of the the ottoman sultanate so to, to build on this further, after the battle of the siege of, um, uh, of um, Minas Tirith is lifted and we have the battle of Pelennor Fields, who arrives to save the day of the battle of Pelennor Fields? It is the Rohirrim. So you could say that not only is Theod an allusion to Theodore Rakes at the battle of the Catalonian Fields, but he is also an allusion to Jan Sobieski, the king of Poland, who led a very famous cavalry charge that dispersed the um, besiegers. I, I believe it was at the Kallenberg. So I think um, I, I'm right in saying that there are a lot of historical allusions that one can draw, and especially in the fact that um, I can't pin my, you know, pin any sort of obvious comparison in terms of the um, the, the, pro the progression of the story of Return of the King, where we have, you know, such a massive rollback on all these centuries of Turkish conquest throughout um, Central Europe, as we see with um, the reconquest of um, much of Athelian and Gondor after the, you know, the new age of Elisar, um, again, the second name of Aragon. Uh, what do you think of that, um, uh, that summary I've made? I think it's really good, and I, I didn't know any of that before, so thank you for sharing that. That was wonderful. Um, the, o the only thing, if I may add, is a, a mythological comparison with Minas Tirith, because they're twin cities, as you alluded, alluded to. So in Revelation, you've got the New Jerusalem, but you've also got Babylon. And if I may just, um, there's a few verses in Revelation 18, which I think exactly sound like Minas Morgul. Um, so 
uh, from verse 2, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. And the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. If we think the ring wraiths are kings of men who have basically pledged allegiance to Sauron for power, they have committed adultery with the great evil. Mm. This ba- Babylon here is is, is Minas Morgul, and it's it's in direct um, contrast to the New Jerusalem of Minas Tirith. So it's, it, I love how you've you've just given a fantastic array of historical sources, and Tolkien's blending it with the mythology, and it brings it to life both parts to life in this kind of wonderful fantasy. It's truly amazing. Absolutely. And I, I think, um, if, if nothing else, it's testament to the incredible richness, depth, and variety of the inspirations you can see on um, on Tolkien. And really, you know, one, one can read Tolkien in so many ways. You know, mine is just, um, mine is just one reading, of course. And um, I wouldn't like to... Um, to imply that it's necessarily the correct one you know it's important to note that Tolkien studies is a bona fide you know academic branch and um has been for quite some time and um there is of course even an academic journal dedicated to Tolkien studies called Miflor and in terms of you know reading about this I mentioned Tom Shippey but of course there is the um the the Tolkien encyclopedia which is you know very extensive um and also, I, th- I think it's important to mention that in terms of the the actual source material beyond just the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, as you mentioned, the Third Age, um, we were very lucky in the fact that Christopher Tolkien um, succeeded um, his father in preserving and editing much of his notes to give us, you know, so many of the successive editions of, you know, the Silmarillion and the um, the unfinished tales, and um, yeah. I think it just the point we want to make across is an incredibly rich world and it's incredibly deserving to just again research more and de- delve into the source material or draw these um historical illusions because it will just get um richer and richer and but um and again more extensive and I don't think there's any any way of exhausting the amount of um material you can get from Tolkien. You could literally do thousands of streams on it and never mm. cover all of it. It's it's amazing. <laughs> and indeed, there are channels that have done thousands and thousands of streams. This is just our, our first um, dip into the subject. Um, you mentioned um, before we came on that um, you were willing to make some sort of um, overarching analysis of the, the thematic thread behind the story itself. And, you know, very much you know, I've been referring to the historical illusions of the country of, you know, what, what one can draw from. Um, I have to try and find out how I'm going to access my super chats because something's gone wrong here. Um, would you be able to um, again give us your insight into the significance of the narrative itself? Sure. Although, as as you indicated before, this is a contested point of view, and uh, not every scholar is going to agree with this, or and every fan. Um, but this is my reading uh, of kind of the the theological framework which underpins the whole of the Lord of the Rings, uh, being deeply Christian. And let me kind of indicate with a couple of passages which might lead us on towards it. So when uh, Gandalf first tells Frodo about the ring or explains the significance of the ring to Frodo, he talks about how uh, it abandoned Gollum and became Bilbo's in the Mines of Moria, which is told in The Hobbit. And he has this very interesting passage um, where he says, behind that, which is the ring leading Gollum, there was something else at work beyond any designs of the ring maker. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was italicized meant to find the ring Mm. and not by its maker, in which case you also were meant to have it. And that may be an encouraging thought. Now, if we get to the end of The Hobbit, there's another interesting passage here. Right at the end, Bilbo is talking about the prophecies of the old songs where the rivers are flowing with gold. Of course, Smaug has been defeated and the gold of the the Lonely Mountain is being dispersed across Dale. 
and he's kind of mocking the idea that the prophecies have come true. And Gandalf said, and why should not they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself? You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck, mm. just for your sole benefit? You are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I'm very fond of you, but you are only quite a little fellow in a wide world after all. These two passages indicate that there's a certain kind of fate or providence going on within the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And I don't want to get into it fully because I'm aware this will probably be very much covered in the Silmarillion discussion. Um, but I'm just going to indicate there's one final passage, which I think um, maybe hints towards where it's going. And it's in a letter by Tolkien to uh, on dated in 1956, where he's talking about the very end of, or the climax of the story where Frodo um, fails to destroy the ring, but then Gollum uh, takes it and in his, his delight uh, and is dancing away, falls over the edge. Yeah. Frodo deserved all honour because he spent every drop of his power of will and body, and that was just sufficient to bring him to the destined point and no further. Few others, possibly no others of his time, would have got so far. The other power then took over, the writer of the story, by which I do not mean myself, that's one ever-present person who is never absent and never named. So there's a, there's a supernatural agency guiding the story in some way for, mm. for Tolkien. It's not ever explicitly uh, explained in The Lords of the Rings. And the nature of the story itself, um, Tolkien explains in his lecture on fairy stories. And to summarize, it's a eucatastrophe. Yeah. It's a reversal of disaster, but at the moment of grace's crisis, grace intervenes unlooked for. And this parallels or is a, a shadow of the Christian story where at the point of sin, where damnation looks inevitable, Christ enters history. The incarnation uh, becomes the thing, it's the grace unlooked for, and the resurrection is the reversal of the crisis of the crucifixion. Yeah, And this is the fundamental story of the Lord of the Rings, which is guided by this providential power. So you can see that there's a, even though it's never kind of shoved in your face in the way that I think C.S. Lewis tries to do with the Narnia stories, mm. for Tolkien, the whole narrative of the Lord of the Rings is guided by a supreme power, which is intent on um, resolving the story in a way that produces joy and consolation. Hmm. It's interesting. I think, um, again, this idea of the the guiding hand or, you know, the theological interpretation of history is something I'm really delving into at the moment. A lot of people have been, again, de delving into this idea that um, one could read Tolkien's work as inherently, you know, commenting on, one, one could say, the degeneration of the world and the passing of the world into into new sort of almost infantile forces and hands of men, especially. Um, I, I would almost say that one, one could read it either way. You know, one could read it as you know, the inspiration of, you know, uh, some divine being, you know, whether that be um, Iluvatar or, you know, the the ever present sort of influence of um, the Ainur or, or, you know, something else, you know, or the Valar or something else entirely, or whether this is actually, in a way, you know, this represents a tragedy because, of course, at the end, um, we do have the the parting of the elves and we do have the parting of Frodo into the, the into into the lands of um, of eternal light, into the um, the lands of Valinor, and um, there is a part of me which does sort of read um, Lord of the Rings as a tragedy, even though you do have that. You mentioned you know, Euro catastrophe in the moment of crucifixion. Of course, in addition to the hobbits fulfilling their um, their duty, and whether that again be that be due to luck or anything, um, Tolkien's subversion of that trait of the classic hero as represented through um, the hobbits is certainly fascinating. But um, of course, we do have the slight subversion of the trope of the return of the king, which is Aragorn. So at the moment, you have um, a hint of joy in the sense that the hobbits have fulfilled that task, but in the sense that you do have that hint of tragedy in the fact that, um, 
again, Frodo will never truly heal from this. And I'd like to talk about this more than when we get really into the depth of the characters, because the characters, again, are fascinating and multi-layered. But I think there are, there are two readings, one that there is a benevolent force, but one that there is a fundamental tragic aspect to the Lord of the Rings. And you know, as we pass into the fourth age, we are passing into the fundamentally into the unknown a world, which is you know completely foreign to say the era of the first age. I, I don't think the two readings are incompatible. I don't believe they're incompatible. I believe they go side by side. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just a matter of which one you draw more emphasis on, I suppose. In the same way that um, one can say that one can draw a pagan reading and a Christian reading from the sources, and oddly enough, they go hand in hand. They don't. Mm -hmm. um, they don't conflict with each other, and again, this is just fascinating elements of the you know, almost say the paradoxes of Tolkien. The fact that you can add these juxtaposing elements all at the same time. I mean, I just mentioned all the juxtaposing elements which make up Gondor itself, and what could it, it could represent? And yet, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's all this inspiration, all of these different sources which Tolkien's relied on, this massive body of research, all coming together. And yet, despite all the little anachronisms, you know, we mentioned the Shire in particular being an, a form of anachronism, it manages to create a cohesive unity, a creative whole, which is incredibly satisfying. And the more you look into it, I mean, with so much bad literature, the more you read into it, you know, the more you can just pick apart and you know tear apart the world. I mean, Harry Potter is a is a good example of this. It's it's something that um you know I read as a child, and um ever thinking back on it, I just there there are little elements of brilliance in there. But one the world is one when one, one thinks about it, one just has to tear it apart essentially. But go back to Lord of the Rings. I'm just always overjoyed and fascinated and always inclined to learn more about the world. And it's not just reading Tolkien, you're just not reading Tolkien, but you're reading his magisterial understanding of history and mythology as well. And it's all being imprinted through this work. You know, you could almost say that um, the fantasy work is an extension of his, again, his um, intellectual pursuits as well, which is why it's such a fascinating work, which is always so endearing. So um, yes, I, I wouldn't say that the the tragic element and the um, the element of joy are in any way juxtaposed. Like I said, there is a well, they are juxtaposed, of course, but there is this weird consistency. There is this weird unity which um, Tolkien is able to achieve, which I think um, is part of his genius. Very much so. And if, if just to add to that, uh, in his uh, lecture on fairy stories, one of the things that that Tolkien really wants to emphasize is that in his view, all mythology points towards, or is um, a kind of, uh, has the same substance as the gospel for him. It's the same, it, the gospel or the life of Jesus Christ is mythology and history come together. Mm. I think you can see that very much in the Lord of the Rings. Um, but that doesn't mean mythology gets done away with. It still, it points towards those truths. Uh, that he believes in, mm. so that's how I think he he can he's he's quite happy to harmonise because in his view they're not distinct sorts of things. They're no, actually I think, um, one and the same. One and could so, see it. Sorry, one could see it. Um, the, again, um, in, in terms of the variations of history, um, despite the fact you know I, I come from a background of, of, of academic history. I am more drawn and more interested in what you could call um, the theogony or theogonic history or ethnogonic history, um, which again is the historical element where you know very much typified before the um, the 18th century, so, so to speak, which is this idea that there has to be some sort of you know teleology or there has to be some sort of underlying story element or some sort of cohesive whole uh, to a structure. And I think um, Lord of the Rings, you could say, is one of the most perfect um theogonic histories of a civilization that doesn't exist and um that that's what's you know truly amazing about it well put so um i think um unless you have um anything else to say like we said we'll probably come back and um do a stream going through each of the characters and um also we mentioned this is the third age stream so we'll very much like to come back possibly as well and come and debate the um the significance of the Silmarillion. I mean, we've done this out of order. We've, we've done this really in order of publication um, rather than order of chronology. I mean, just a little note about the Silmarillion versus the Lord of the Rings. Um, one thing which is important to note about the background of Lord of the Rings is that it was really a, um, 
a, an accident in, in many sense. You know, you could say the Silmarillion was a work of 60 years that was never finished. I, I mean, the Silmarillion we have was uh, published posthumously and edited by um, Christopher Tolkien in 1977. Tolkien died in 1973. Um, when it comes to the Lord of the Rings itself, the reason we have it essentially is because of the success of The Hobbit. And um, that's why in The Hobbit, you know, we have such a, we have various um, editions of The Hobbit. The first edition, of course, is um, the most anachronistic when viewed as you know, part of a whole with The Lord of the Rings. Um, even in the naming conventions, um, you could say, you know, compared to the rich naming conventions in the in the overall Tolkien legendarium, um, The Hobbit is quite lazy, as it was intended to be a children's story. And yet from this, you know, children's story, this accident, uh, we have the Lord of the Rings. And one of the, um, the things that Tolkien looked back on The Hobbit is that he wished he could rewrite it entirely to make it part of this um, consistent whole with the Lord of the Rings, which, you know, was incidental and pushed by his um, publisher. But really, you know, um, the Silmarillion was the, um, the grand project it, because it incorporates more of these elements. And, you know, the tragedy being, you know, it was never finished. So we'll, we'll try and cover that um, at a later point. But um, going to the Super Chats, the Purple Born for 10 Canadian dollars, a little money for a new streaming computer. I hope you'll talk about the poetry and songs that are integral to Lord of the Rings that are left out of the movies. Now, when it comes to the poetry and songs, obviously we, I mean, we, we'd be mentioning, you know, all the inspirations behind it. Um, when it comes to the, you know, the wonderful literature itself, I mean, maybe because again, this, this is an evolving subject, you know, Tolkien studies is such, as we mentioned, such an expansive, such an expansive area. Um, we could, you know, agree on a couple of um, poems and we can really dissect them and try and find all the inspira inspirations behind them. That might, might be quite a nice, um, relaxing stream to do, um, if that's all right with you at some point, Nathan. Um, well, it sounds excellent. I would, I would just add as well, that with the Silmarillion discussion, the role of music and poetry mm -hmm. uh, will be very much dissected. So it's very, if you're interested in that, that would be worth tuning in for because, um, it's integral to the very fabric of Middler. Absolutely. King Cribble for five pounds has said, please delve into the Atlanteans, Cro-Magnons and the Numenorians of Umbar and Middle-earth versus the Hyperborean theory that I know so little about. <laughs> this is, um, I'm not sure, again, where I haven't seen, I have seen articles written about, um, and I've read articles written about um, Evla and, um, and Tolkien, but um, in terms of this theory, this is, this is something I considered when I was reading through um, Revolt of the Modern World again, rather recently, um, which is talking about the the different the different origins and the different like civilizational poles of the Numenorians versus the Germanic people. So we're talking about um, the the Rohirrim and possibly even the Hobbits. I think the only sort of thing I can really make make an addition to the points I've already made. Uh, apart from again the the Western theory applying to the more Semitic peoples and the possible allusion to um, Atlantis is that in that theory there is always this constant allusion to crossing over the Western Ocean and the Atlantic into a into a world which is transcendent and beyond all comprehension and I think that's very obvious in the sense that we have in Valinor but um, more so the Hyperborean idea in particular focuses on this. Um, all civilization dwelling, you know, fr from the far north, um, you know, fr fr from from the cold and coming down, and but also there is this reference in it to uh, again Midgard, which um, draws into the um, uh, Germanic uh, the Germanic mythos, which you talked about with the etymology of um, Middle Earth, but also this um, island, which was supposed to be north of um, Great Britain, which is supposed to be you know where the gods dwelt. I mean, there's even some hypothesis that Britain itself was a um, an incredibly sacred island, and that this you know Tolkien himself was you know profoundly aware that um, this um, Hyperborean theory could correspond you know to England itself, and that England could have some sort of um, transcendent sacred experience. I think in many ways. Um, he, he part of his um again r reason for writing was to find an English mythology. You know, it comes across more in the Silmarillion than it does um in um in Lord of the Rings. So, you know, one can say that um the Hobbits is an allusion to I wouldn't say mythology. I would say it's just an, an allusion to pre-conquest life, even though it's done through the vein of um early modern history as we talked about. But when it comes to you know Tolkien had like an obsession, an overriding obsession with trying to come up with a uncorrupted 
pre-conquest form of you know English culture, which existed between the um, the sixth and the eleventh centuries. I think this would have very much added into that, and it's something which um, I've only just really begin to scratch the surface of. So I have to do much more research on that. But I know that um, Tolkien did try and come up with um, a primordial god who would be um, like the father of Hengist and Horsa. I think the god of the sea and the waves, um, known as I think he he created the god Ing. Who would um, essentially be, you know, the the primordial god who would get, who would um, get produce some um, Hengist and Horsa, but you know, like like I said, you know, Tolkien himself only scratched the surface, and he, even though he played around with this idea, and I'm, I'm sure Evla would have recognised at the same time, it's important to note that these two people were uh, working contemporaneously you know, at the same time. Um, a lot, a lot of stuff to consider. Nathan, do you have anything to say on that? Uh, no, I, I I just want to tell you that I told you so that people would be interested in this and you should do more work on it. It's yes. such a fascinating illusion. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I'll say that's um, you know a, a good sort of exactly two hours. That's a good mark to to end it. Unless um, Nathan, you want to say anything else before we go? So it's been a pleasure, and I can't wait for the next one. So I'll give you um, an opportunity then to um, to show your superb channel. Oh, well, check out my channel. I hope in the next couple of weeks to do a video examining some of the the ways that we can undergo spiritual transformation or what might be involved in that process. So come along and check it out. Wonderful. And I can't recommend his channel enough. Um, thank you all very much for listening. Um, in terms of future streams, we have um, a stream on the Great Migrations next Monday at 9. And in two weeks' time, we will be having a heterodox stream on Homer, uh, so looking into the Iliad and the Odyssey with Columba. Um, again, moving on this um, this theme with um, t delving into um, mythologies and epic poetry. Um, you know, quite an interesting tangent we've gone on. And l like I said, we'll hopefully come back in a few weeks' time and um, do that character assessment of um, the Third Age. Thank you all very much for listening, and good night.